Good morning, First Baptist Church. You see this happy guy on the screen? He's announcing to us our sermon series that we've been in. It's called Contagious Faith. You have to have it to give it. Now, this uh, sermon series is based on the one another commandments. And did you know that there's 37 one another commandments in the Bible? Most of them are positive, but there are some that are negative. Do not lie to one another. Do not bite or devour one another. But I think they all have two things in common. I think they all come from the great love one another commandment. And I think they all have to do with service. So when I pray for the other, I serve her. When I bear his burden or forgive the other, I serve them. When I rejoice or exhort, I serve that person. We're going to go and look today at Galatians chapter 6, 1 through 5. And as this text um, is the the text that we're preaching on, it's important that we realize that in the book of Galatians, there is a battle going on. And it's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. It's a battle between legalism and liberty, a battle of being led by the spirit of Christ and being led by the flesh. Christ's way is freedom. The law of the flesh is slavery. If we want to live in bondage and legalism, without hope, we choose to live under the law of the flesh. But if we choose to live in liberty with tremendous hope and assurance, we choose to live under the law of the Spirit of Christ. There are three basic assumptions that lay under this... um, lay under the one another commandments. The first assumption is that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Jesus incorporated the one another commandments in his life, and so should we. In order to do this, Jesus must be on the throne of our lives. We must be crucified in Christ, as it says in Galatians 2.20. He is our Lord. So the first assumption is Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior. The second assumption is that we are led by the Spirit in all that we do. If you look at the second half of Galatians chapter 5, Galatians 5 tells us in that portion, be filled with the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.18 says, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And then the third assumption is that in Christ, we know who we are. There are three verses in this section, verse 1, verse 3, and verse 4 of Galatians chapter 6. And there's just phrases in these verses to admonish us and to give us teaching that we're supposed to have a proper appraisal of who we are, a proper evaluation of what we can do and what we can't do. And I'd like to unpack this third assumption, if I could, for a little bit. So one who keeps in step with the Spirit develops a correct evaluation of oneself, understands who he is. First, let's look at the end of verse 1 to gain a proper appraisal of ourselves. It says, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. We are to have an accurate view of our capabilities. We need to realize and understand that we are just as vulnerable as the next guy who falls into sin. John Bradford looked on others with humble compassion. One day he saw a poor criminal led to execution, and he exclaimed, There, but for the grace of God, goes John Bradford. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stand 
Take heed lest he fall. Let's realize that we all have clay feet up to our eyebrows and we can all stumble and fall into sin. No one is exempt from doing that. And then in verse 3, there's a phrase that says, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. We're not to be self-conceited and have an inflated view of ourself. It's important that we realize that we're ordinary. We have no right to look down or to speak down to another. Be careful that the yoke of legalistic deception doesn't wrap around our minds so that we stop thinking clearly about our own individual, vulner- that we are vulnerable. It's important to always remember Romans 12.3 that says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly than he ought to think each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And then the third admonition or phrase in this section, it comes from verse four. It says, but let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. We would be wise to understand that even those things we are good at, didn't come from ourselves. Uh, They came from God. Your intelligence, your athletic ability, your capacity to think and orate, to play a musical instrument, or to do anything, be a plumber or a carpenter or electrician, those capacities and abilities didn't come from you. They are gifts from the eternal God. Uh, The message... Uh, by John, by Peterson, in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, says, Isn't everything you have and everything you are sheer gifts from God? So what's the point of all this comparing and competing? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? We need to be humble and have a proper appraisal and evaluation of who we are. So, to start, who is a contagious Christian? A contagious Christian is Christ-centered. Christ is his Lord. He's spirit-led, walking in step with the Spirit each and every moment. And he's properly grounded. He has a proper appraisal of his capabilities and capacities. That's who a contagious Christian is. But what does a contagious Christian do? Uh, First and foremost, a contagious Christian initiates the healing process. If you look at verse 1 of Ephesians 6, It says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Uh, She engages, or the spirit-filled person goes throughout her day, and when she notices anyone, it may be someone she knows, it may be someone she doesn't know. It could be a Christian, it could be a non-Christian. But when she notices someone and they've been caught by surprise, that person has been overtaken or overwhelmed by a transgression, a sin. It could be that that someone who is addicted to alcohol and can't get out of the trap or someone who's entrapped in legalism based on the book of Galatians. The possibilities are endless. She just doesn't stand there and do nothing like it's none of her business. She doesn't ignore it, hoping that it'll go away. She engages as a healer, 
not as a condemner. She doesn't engage with the person in the trespass as a legalist. She doesn't do as the Pharisees did in chapter 8, drag the lady in front of the crowd and say, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. She's violated the law and she deserves to be stoned. She has made her bed. She knew the rules. Now let her lie in it and reap what she has sown. Legalists don't care how the offender feels. Their purpose is to expose them and condemn them and then to gossip about them to anyone who will listen. The spirit-filled, contagious believer doesn't respond like that. She engages in his trespass to start the healing and restoration process. She's helping her brother become free and achieve victory over the trespass. Art and Gendridge stated that the word restore literally means to put in order, to restore to its former condition. It was used in the secular Greek as a medical term for setting a fractured or dislocated bone. She deals with the trespass with gentleness. And we know that gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. She doesn't speak down at the one who's entrapped because she realizes that, except for the grace of God, she could do the same thing. The one who walks in the Spirit sets the bone or puts the dislocated bone back in place in order to help the process of healing restoration begin. Are we healers? Are we helpers? When our neighbor sins and falls in surprise in the trap? Or are we condemners and criticizers like the legalists? Tori Robinson, a classmate of mine in seminary, he asked a question in a sermon that he preached, and he asked, are you a there you are person or a here I am person? You know, a here I am person has all the arrows of their life pointing inward. He or she's a legalist. They're judgmental, they're selfish. And they say, here I am Meet my need. They really don't care about what the other person thinks. They don't have the bandwidth nor the giftedness to help with others. Their radio is turned to WIFM. What's in it for me? They're legalists. They're Pharisees. They're scribes. The same as they were in Jesus' day. They're here I am people. But Christ is in the business of transformation. He doesn't want us to stay here I am people. When we come to Christ and make him Lord, when we're filled with the Spirit, when we have a proper appraisal of who we are, he wants us to become a there you are person. Where the arrows of our life go outward and they see the person who's been entrapped by sin or the one who has a burden that's too heavy to carry. And uh, they see that and they say by God's grace, I'm here to help you. Let's start the healing process in your life. Let's start by setting the bone or relocating the dislocated bone in the body. You see, a contagious Christian says, there you are. I see your need. I'm here to help. Not only does the contagious Christian help initiate the healing process to the brother or the sister who has been injured, and we see that in verse 1, but in verse 2, she helps lift the burden that is too heavy to carry. Verse 2 says, Bear one another burdens, 
and so fulfill the law of Christ. Notice the assumption here. We all have burdens. And God doesn't mean that we carry them alone. He doesn't want us to be lone rangers. I can do this by myself. I don't need you. No, he wants us to know that we need somebody to carry our burdens with us. And secondly, did you notice? We should not keep our burdens to ourselves, but rather seek a Christian friend who will help bear them with us. Again, there's no room for lone rangers in the body of Christ. Let's admit we need help and we can't carry our burdens by ourselves. I belong to a men's group in this church, and it's been a godsend for me. We made a covenant with each other that there's no secrets, and we don't carry our own burdens either. And it has been good for me to have my burdens being shared with others so they can help carry them. It's important to realize that the word burden here means a heavy weight. It exceeds the strength of those who are trying to carry it. When we moved back to Italy, from Italy six years ago, my son helped me move a bird's eye metal chest of drawers into our third floor condo. We received the piece of furniture in inheritance from my mom's folks. Let me tell you, that is the last time I do that. That was a burden that was almost too heavy for me. Oh, it was more than too heavy for me. But it was almost too heavy for me and my son. And by the time we got it up into my bedroom, I thought, man, I'm about ready to die. That's the type of burden that God is talking about here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. It's too heavy. And God isn't necessarily talking about a piece of furniture, but he could be. It's any type of burden. But I think probably in this context, it's probably the burden of legalism. You know, the holy Joes of the Jews who lived in Galatia in that area and those who came from Jerusalem, after Paul and Barnabas left Galatia after their first missionary journey, they created a vacuum. And that vacuum was filled by these holy Joes who were of the Jewish religion. We call them Judaizers. One who lift up the law and the Old Testament of Moses and they shove it down the throat of everybody and they make them try to live by it. So they came into the Galatia and they started talking to the new formed Christians who came to Christ by faith through the grace of God. And they said immediately, well, that's good, but it's not good enough. You need to be circumcised. You need to keep the dietary laws. You need to do all the vows. You need to be an ascetic in a lot of your ways. And if you don't do this, there's no guarantee that much less you're going to heaven or that you're really a Jew and maybe even a Christian. They added that on just for practice. And it was all based on do, do, do the law of the flesh. Isn't it interesting, in Galatians 6, 2.16, Paul writes, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. And the Judaizers were trying to teach these new form believers who were in jeopardy of going the wrong way that you're justified by works of the law. And that's anathema to the gospel. You're justified by faith alone through the grace in Jesus Christ. They were all 
Here I am, people. All the arrows were pointing into their life. And they were doing just what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, 46. Woe to you lawyers. We know that lawyers are legalists. It's that way by trade for a lot of them. For you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Legalists don't get involved in the burdens and the mess of others because they're too selfish. They are all here I am people. Come to me and do what I say. Do what I want. Who cares about your burden? Instead of imposing the law as a burden, we are to give our brother love. Love is an altruistic, other-centered attitude that says, I see you. I'm a there you are person. Uh, he's a contagious Christian. And a contagious Christian says, there you are. I see your need. I'm here to help. And so in verse 5 of chapter 6, we're supposed to be a contagious Christian that is willing to heal and set the bone and willing to help and lift the burden. But in verse 5, he has his own responsibility. He is to bear his own load. Now we heard that the word burden is a weight that too, that's too heavy to carry. You can't carry it all by yourself. But a load is something that's manageable. A load gave reference to a backpack or a day pack that a soldier wore in the line of duty and he used the day pack to carry the essentials to get him through the day. It wasn't too heavy for him. He wasn't fatigued by wearing the pack all day. And it gave him what he needed. And that's the word that we find here. It's the Greek word fortion. It's a pack that we can carry. In fact, in Matthew 11.30, he says that the burden or this load is light. Uh, in fact, um, everybody has that responsibility to carry that load. It's not someone else's to carry. It's every Christian's responsibility to carry his own load. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, first part of that verse says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one must be recompensed, for his deeds done in his body according to what he has done. The Christian will be judged not on his works for salvation. He's judged based on his faith. But he will be judged to give an account for the way he invested his life and for his Christian walk. The load is each person's responsibility to walk in the Spirit before the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have to give an account for Lynn's load. He has a responsibility to do that for himself. But I have a responsibility to give an account for my load. I am responsible for employing my own gift mix in an altruistic lifestyle that says, there you are, I see your need, I'm here to help. The believer is filled with the love of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's there to help, to heal. He's there to lift the burden. He's there to be there for the other person. He carries his own load. If you look at Matthew 11, Verse 28 through 30, it says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
this is a picture where Jesus Christ is the experienced ox. And he has a yoke around his body. And the other yoke uh, is the apprentice or the inexperienced yoke or the ox who's on that side of the yoke. And they're plowing a field and the inexperienced ox looks at the life of Christ and how he's plowing, how he loves one another, how he's filled with the Spirit, how he has an appropriate appraisal for himself, and they go through life walking. And Jesus says that the yoke that the inexperienced uh, ox is in, is it's easy. And it's interesting that the same word for easy is the word for gentleness. I set the bone with gentleness. I minister with gentleness. And my walk is gentle because it's a load that I can handle and I can perform my responsibility by God's grace filled with his spirit. That's what God is driving here at. And uh, it's also interesting that the word for burden is the same word for low, load in Galatians 6.5. The burden is light and the load is light when I'm walking with Christ. Every Christian's load is the responsibility to start the healing process for the sinner caught in a trespass and help lift the burden of the brother or sister in need. The contagious Christian says, there you are, I see your need. I'm here to help. In conclusion, I'm going to say three prayers. And then at the end of the prayer, I'm going to say, Lord, hear and answer my prayer. And if what I've said this morning resonates with you, and you agree with the prayer that I say, I just want you to say in your heart, yes, Lord, amen, do it. So the first prayer is, today, Lord, nudge me by the Holy Spirit to see my neighbor who has been caught by surprise by a trespass. Let me enter into his need and not pull away. Lord, Hear and answer my prayer. The second prayer, Lord, prompt me by the Holy Spirit to see my brother or sister who has a burden that is too heavy for him or her to carry. Let me run to him or her to help lift. Lord, hear and answer my prayer. The third prayer, Lord, as I keep in step with the Spirit today, let me fulfill the duties of my responsibility, my load, so I can give a positive report of the load that you want me to carry. Lord, hear and answer my prayer. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be glorified in this message and may we apply it for your glory and honor as we walk with you.